Hello, I'm Greg Milam, normally Sky's chief North of England correspondent, but here at Sky News HQ for a bit of half-term cover this week. As a correspondent in the North, actually probably like everyone living in this country right now, the economic picture is the background to everything at the moment, how we feel, how we're coping, what we think about the future, actually sometimes just that sheer panic about getting by. And in fact, we're going to hear from a restaurant owner in Manchester in a bit on the day Britain officially enters a recession. But to start this Sky News Daily, what does the official label actually change? Let's ask our economics and data editor, Ed Conway, also on his half-term holiday, but still committed to turning up for the Daily Podcast. Ed, what do we know now that we didn't know before that GDP figure came out? It's funny, there's various different ways you can look at it. I mean, the main story, obviously, that we're all focused on, uh, and, and it's kind of irritating that we all fixate on this, but I guess it's just the way of things, is the recession. And there's this definition of what is a recession. It goes back a few decades. No one's entirely sure. There's various kind of almost origin stories about how, how it came about. But the kind of tradition is normally that people look at quarterly numbers, so three-month blocks. When it shrinks for two quarters in a row, then we tend to talk about that being a recession. It's not the only way that you can kind of define a recession. In other countries like the US, for instance, they have a kind of committee of wise people who decide, well, this looks like it's a recession or not. But in, in most other countries, you just look at the numbers. When they come out, it's like, oh, that one shrank. And then if the next one shrinks, then it's a recession. And that's kind of what happened here. However, you know, it's minus 0.1 and then minus 0.3. Those those are not big falls. And and in every previous recession that we kind of, you know, with a capital R, so going back to the 90s, going back to 2008, going back to early 80s, the, the economy shrank by much more than that. So this would, if the economy kind of grows in the first quarter of the year, which most think people think it will, then this will be the, the most shallow recession since the 1950s. However, that's only kind of one prism. Then you can look at something like GDP per capita, okay? And when you're, and this is in a way, this is a better measure. So GDP is just, you know, how much money we all earn across the economy, aggregated, every business, every household, the whole thing. GDP per capita basically takes that number and it divides it by the number of people there are in the country. And in a way, that's a better measure, isn't it? Because the population is always growing and that gives you a sense of just how well off or, or otherwise people are becoming. And if you look at GDP per capita, well, the economy actually is shrinking. So on that, through that prism, we are getting worse off. And in fact, not just in the last couple of quarters, not just in the last year, although it shrank by 0.7% in the last year, but it's been shrinking every quarter, GDP per capita, uh, since early 2022. And so that picture, which to be honest with you, is the one that you probably should look at, and we don't look at enough, says we've kind of been in recession effectively for a long time. And that probably is the one that accords with, with most people's experience. You know, it feels like it's been really tough. The cost of living crisis has been difficult for, for so many households. So you get a better sense of national income when you consider it alongside how many people there are too. Which, which makes sense, doesn't it? And in this case, it's particularly ripe because we've had such a big increase in the population over the last couple of years due to higher immigration. I mean, you know, there, that, that's a whole other topic, obviously, in itself. However, it has a bearing on overall economic statistics, because if there's more people in the country, that usually means more people doing stuff, which in turn, that drives up your GDP. If it wasn't for high migration right now, we would definitely be in recession, you know, quite deeply in recession. And that's what those numbers are, are telling you. But I think there's definitely a kind of a broader thing here, which is that in some sense, it would be nice not to fixate on a certain number. But the Prime Minister did say at the start of 2023, he said, judge me by these five pledges that I'm going to give you. you know, one of them was, of course, kind of halving inflation. But the other one was growing the economy. But just look at GDP, which was the number he was talking about here, the overall, the big number. Um, that is, I mean, it's basically flat. It hasn't really grown in 2023. And actually, when you look at it in, in four, to four decimal places, which I'm afraid to say, Greg, I did... <laughs> then actually the economy is shrinking by 0.011% or shrank in, in 2023. But obviously, you know, that's kind of dancing on the head of a pin. But the bigger picture is there's no growth there. And actually, when you look at it in the kind of the better measure, which is GDP per capita, looking at it, you know, across households, then it, it, we are shrinking. And, and how much of this has been driven by consumer behaviour? We're talking about the quarters leading up to Christmas. We know how people feel about mm. their their finances. This makes absolute sense if this is based on whether people are spending money or not. 
Yeah, specifically like the last the last couple of quarters, which is the the period of, of official recession, um, people just haven't been spending as much, and, and that's totally understandable, isn't it? You know, and it accords with what we are picking up from talking to people, which is that everyone is squeezed, and they're squeezed from a long, long period of, of seeing their cost of living increase, seeing energy bills go up, uh, and although the rate of inflation is now kind of coming down, it's not like it's not like it's any easier. And, you know, I went out and spoke to lots of people on the high street in Southampton, and you, you really do get the sense that literally everyone I spoke to said this Christmas, you know, it wasn't like it was a total disaster. It just didn't have any of the zing that we were expecting of, of previous Christmases, which just makes things at the margin that bit tougher. And if you look at the statistics from the ONS, the, the ones we're talking about here, GDP numbers, they say, yeah, primarily it was the retail sector that was the big explanation for, for negative for that minus 0.3 in the final quarter. On that note, to get a, to get a sense of, of what it's like for real people living in the real world, we've been speaking to uh, Karina Jadav, who owns a restaurant in Manchester. She's on the nighttime mm. economy panel. She gets a real sense of what's going on across that city in terms of retail and restaurants, the nighttime economy, and got a sense from her of just whether these figures tally with what she was experiencing. So for us over the past 12 months, I mean, for a start, our suppliers have consistently been putting their prices up because they've had to, you know, obviously importing goods has become more expensive and there's other pressures around that. So we're never sure when the next increase is coming there. And we've absorbed that cost quite a lot, as I think many have, because we're very conscious that the consumer doesn't necessarily have that extra disposable income to be paying more for the same product that they were consuming 12 months ago at a lower price. And then beyond that, there's the cost of utilities. In the past year, our electricity bill has basically reached the same amount as our rent. It was a thousand pounds difference. We were paying 15,000 pounds a month for electricity, which is extortionate from what we were used to. And then there's things like the increase in national minimum wage, which you know I wholeheartedly support, making sure that everybody is paid fairly, and proportionately to what's going on. It's just that as a business, we don't necessarily have an increased margin to pay for that. I guess the other end of this equation is the people coming through the doors or not coming through the doors. And these figures reflect the people, as we know, are not spending because they're feeling the pinch. What are you seeing in, in terms of the other end of your business, the actual customers? We could be very busy, but we could still not be making money if we weren't super careful behind the scenes with our margins. And there definitely was still an appetite, but it's decreased. So we've seen a decrease in our year on year sales. And then this January just gone, we've had the quietest January, you know, except for COVID when we were closed that I've ever seen. It was shocking, to be honest. Tell us about that that part of the year. I guess leading up to Christmas, you would hope, retail would hope it's a, a good time of year. What did you see over the, the, the end of last year? I think we were surprised at how well Christmas performed because pretty much every month prior to that had been underperforming and it was a much quieter year than we previously seen, which meant we had to adapt quickly. But we also had to continually monitor the cost from our suppliers and you know make sure that we were pricing correctly because the other thing that we've seen happening is that they were increasing the prices and wouldn't necessarily communicate those. I think the poor trading from 2023 has impacted what's happened at the beginning of this year because we've seen something like 27 restaurants close in Manchester alone, you know, from the 31st December onwards. That's huge. I know you sit on the Mayor Andy Burnham's nighttime economy panel. And from what you say there, talking to, to other operators in, uh, in and around uh, the city, what is the the general picture that you get? I think we are just hoping for change. I'm definitely hoping that we do see the government responding to calls for a decrease in VAT to show a fair reflection of what's going on within this industry. And also that we are the third largest industry in the UK and we're struggling. We're just trying to get by. I don't see great hope at the moment because I think what really needs to happen is for people to be able to afford their just day-to-day -day bills before we can expect to see more consumers coming back into restaurants and bars. And I don't necessarily see that happening. Like the people making decisions don't necessarily understand the day-to-day -day operations of a restaurant and bar or other small to medium businesses. Um, and we are the lifeblood of the country. Like we are the people that keep things ticking over. And it's such a big ecosystem that it's short-sighted to ignore 
what's going on. Does what's happening now make you think about your future in, in that business? I think I've worked in this industry for, you know, 14, 15 years now. So I'm so far in that I would hope that my career will continue this route. You know, I've got a lot invested in this business as well, so I wouldn't give up on it easily. But we we are carrying post-COVID debt and we are under a great deal of pressure at the moment. My neighbour next door is due to leave their unit in April, which will be awful for us because it just means that we are then further isolated and there's less pe- reason for people to visit this development that I'm on. So she's she's talking there about people not coming through the door and yet still having to to pay the bills and keep and keep restaurants going and and the large number that are not being kept going where this feels like a recession depends on who you are where you are whether you have a mortgage whether you own your home outright i think that's right i think you know different people are feeling it very differently but it's you still have that sense of lots of different things kind of closing in on people all, all at one time and so for retailers there's definitely that sense of well, you know, my, my costs are going up. I'm not necessarily getting the, the, the income I, I'm kind of, you know, accustomed to. And you've got other things like the, the, the minimum wage. That's going up and there's not much that you can do about that. And, and so those frustrations are still playing out and you're yet to see any of the, the kind of improvement that most people were expecting uh, in spending. And you see that kind of in retail, but you see it in pretty much every business uh, that we talked to recently, whether it's retail, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's other parts of the service sector. But we hear the jobs market is resilient, wage growth outpacing inflation. What what does that tell us more broadly is going on? So the big picture is, in some senses, it feels like a kind of recession when you look at how, how well off we all are. But in other senses, you know, we are starting to kind of bounce back from it. Uh, we haven't had a massive increase in, in unemployment. Interest rates are very high. And it looks like they'll come down. And certainly the fact that, that you've got a recession now means the Bank of England is, is going to be more likely to, to cut rates kind of sooner. So all of these things add up. And we should be seeing a stronger economy this year and next. But I just think the bigger picture, you know, when you're looking at what's happened, so what what is the thing that brings everything together? What is what is it that happened in in early 2022 um, that coincided with this the beginning of us seeing our standard of living falling and falling and falling, GDP per capita going down and down and down? It is Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and it is, it is gas prices going up very fast, and it is energy costs increasing. And you know when we talk about energy, and we've we've talked about this so many times before, haven't we? Energy costs are everywhere. You know, 40% of pretty much everything you buy, 40% of that cost is energy. And so, and it depends, it varies depending on what you're buying. And therefore, given we have seen those gas prices go up, given we are a big importer of energy, we are worse off as a nation and we've had to adjust to that. However, now having made the adjustment, then things can hopefully start to improve in the coming months uh, and, and, and years. And so everyone, pretty much every economist is looking at the numbers and saying, "Okay, after this little dip, we're expecting things to bounce back pretty well this year and next. Maybe not, you know, the kind of growth you might like to see in the economy. You know, 2 percent was was the number that the trend growth number that people used to hope for. We're not coming close to that necessarily. But you are seeing something that's that's closer to actual growth rather than the kind of, I guess, fake growth that we see right now. This is an election year, of course, and this is problematic for for the prime minister because we have Mm. an economy that's stuck and stagnating. Well, it's problematic both because he stakes his reputation on economic growth, uh, because he uh, and Jeremy Hunt were the people who were brought in to try and clean up the mess when Liz Truss left. It's problematic because the Conservatives have a reputation historically for being the party of economic, good economic governance, and the economy is not doing very well right now. Um, and it's problematic because it goes back to that old kind of James Carville saying, you know, that it, it's the economy stupid. And every, pretty much every election, or most elections, you know, there are exceptions, but most elections are fought to some extent on, are you feeling better off than you were a year ago or two years ago or however long it is? And in this case, people can look at the statistics and say, honestly, look, based on the data, 
I'm not better off than I was a year ago. I'm not better off than I was two years ago. In fact, I'm not better off than I was quite a few years ago because GDP per capita, that critical measure, has been so weak for quite so long. And I think that is going to be a big problem for the Conservative Party, particularly given that usually is one of their stronger cards. There is no obvious lever that you could pull that would make things better. And obviously there's little things, OK? So you know, people look at Brexit and they say that's a part of the explanation. It does look like it is definitely part marginally of the explanation for why we have a slightly weaker economy than we would do otherwise. And that makes sense because we're, you know, there, there's more friction in trade and when it costs more to bring things in and we, we rely on imports a lot for our economy, then naturally that's going to make the economy less well off. But by the same token, those effects are small compared with the kind of energy Russia effects. Those effects are small compared with the fact that we have had to adjust massively to a different standard of living because all of our energy is more expensive. And so there are certainly things that can be done, but it's not obvious that there's a lever that either party has at their disposal that suddenly makes us all better off. Ironically enough, you know, the one thing that most people point to is, well, you could just kind of invest more money on things like green energy, which is precisely what Keir, you know, Keir Starmer has just kind of backed out of, or at least backed out of that £28 billion pledge. He's still going to invest some money. So that's kind of the one thing that a lot of people think might be a good idea uh, to try and get growth growing. And, and it looks like that you've got both parties kind of backing away from it. Election related, can we talk about what's on the front of the, the Financial Times today, the suggestion that Jeremy Hunt is considering slashing billions of pounds from public spending plans to fund tax cuts pre-election? Mm. Um, if, yes. if the budget in March shows that finances are still tight, which mm. I guess we assume they will be. Uh, is that realistic? Um, well, he can do it. It's a bit of a cheat, to be honest with you. And it all comes back to this thing I'm really irritated by and have, have kind of moaned about in the past, which is that w what is the constraint that he's concerned about, or indeed that Rachel Reeves is concerned about? They talk about kind of this idea of fiscal headroom. So here's how much room we have to spend. That room is only versus the fiscal rules that they've implemented. In other words, there's no God-given reason why he needs to try and keep his, his giveaways to £13 billion or whatever the number is. It's £13 billion is the latest estimate. There's only his own rules. And in order to keep to his rules, he has to do all sorts of financial fiscal jiggery-pokery to try and make it look like he has money to spend. And that's essentially what it sounds like they're, they're kind of gearing up to do. So if you say that you're going to kind of slash public spending in the, in the fourth and the fifth year of your forecast, then that means that theoretically you have more room to spend. But it's, it's, it's a mirage. It's not real in any sense. Fiscal headroom is a made up thing. It is a made up thing that obsesses people in Westminster. And what's also kind of frustrating is it, it clearly obsesses Rachel Reeves as well, because she said she's gonna keep to the same fiscal rules as well. But as I say, there is no reason why they couldn't just say, well, forget about these rules. We're going to be sensible. So we're not going to be like quasi Kwarteng and kind of throw out the rules and not explain what, why we're doing it and how we're going to spend our money. But there, there is a way that you as a government could say you're going to have a bit more money to spend while also kind of not having to, uh, to be specific about the fiscal rules that you're keeping to. I kind of tend to think that. But instead, we have this strange dance ahead of the budget, and I'm doubtless we'll have it ahead of the election as well, where everyone goes on and on about fiscal headroom. But in reality, what they're saying is, these are the rules, and we're going to do whatever accounting tricks we can to try and keep to the rules while giving the impression we're being very sensible with the public finances. So it's, it, it's, it's a game. So it seems like a game to me. And it's a game with the public finances that means that you're not actually getting a sense in the long run about how much they're going to be spending on public services come 2027, which is, which is kind of what, what matters more than anything else. So, sorry, I mean, that's my rant. But I, but well, I'm, glad I we've identified, I'm, glad we've, I'm glad we've identified what it is that really winds you up, Ed. Uh, <laughs> it's not going to be the last time. We'll, we'll, we'll probably rant about it a bit more in the future. Well, look, before we let you go back to your half-term break, is there any reason at all anywhere for some optimism? Well, yeah, because like it's, you know, this, the adjustment in terms of our living standards has been really tough and really painful. And in some senses, it's still ongoing. And that's what we're experiencing all the time. Stuff is more expensive. And why is stuff more expensive? It's because our energy costs are more. And it probably means, unfortunately, that that stuff isn't going to suddenly go down to the same extent that it went up. However, the big adjustment, okay, the big cut to our living standards, the big increase in the cost of everything, 
most of that has now already fed through. In the coming months, in the coming year or so, things should not be getting any worse than they, they were before. I know that's maybe kind of doesn't sound like the most glorious uh, outlook, but it has been really tough. And we've taken a lot of the pain. We've taken that pain. And now hopefully we can kind of move on and start to, to, to grow a bit more. And I think we will. And I think things will feel less grim in, in a year's time or so. Uh, we'll start to see a bit more income in our pockets. We will start to see interest rates starting to come down, which, of course, borrowers is, is good news. And savers are already actually benefiting quite a lot from, from higher interest rates. The next kind of 12 months won't be as, as, as miserable as the last 12 months. And so I, I think actually there is kind of some positive news ahead, notwithstanding all of the scary stuff that's happening internationally. Things look a, a, a tiny, that you can see a tiny uh, light at the end of the tunnel, at least, and we are heading towards it. Thanks very much, Ed. That's all from me for now. Leah will be with you tomorrow. <laughs>